What is the key to cycling faster? Well, aside from aerodynamics, it comes down to power. And I think it's fair to say that we'd all like a little more, or in my case, a lot more power when it comes to riding the bike. So what is the answer? Well, I'm gonna be finding out from a pro who certainly knows how to put the power down on the bike. I'm on my way to find the Olympic silver medalist from London 2012, Sweden's Lisa Norden. Now, unfortunately for Lisa, she's actually struggled with quite a few injuries since winning that medal when it comes to the run. But as a result, she's had a lot of time to work on her bike and she's improved so much on the bike, so much so that she's actually currently the national title holder in Sweden for the road race and the time trial. So who better to speak to to find out how to get more power? So Lisa, um, you know, it's very unusual to have a triathlete who's at the top of um, their game in another sport as well. And for you, obviously, it's cycling. Is there a magic recipe? How have you become so strong on the bike? Uh, so I'm lucky to train with the Norwegian team. Uh, they do a lot of biking. You see, even if they train for a short course on Olympic distance, they seem to do pretty well on some different distance yeah. as well. Um, a lot of people think they do a lot of biking and maybe too much for short course stuff. Uh, they managed to use it to their advantage and for me it's been a huge benefit just to incorporate that into my training program and it, from having been a strong biker it kind of took the biking to another level. Can you explain some of the key sessions that, that you do and that have really started to make the difference on the bike? So before uh, with Darren, my old coach, like the main thing for me to win medal was to improve my swimming mm -hmm. and improve my running. So where do you put the time? It's like the biggest difference is in the first and the third leg. Yeah. So the biking was good, it was strong, and we just kind of maintained the biking. And I started to train with Ariel, then he wanted to up the biking. So then we spent a lot of time building the engine. So basically that's what the Norwegians do. In, mm -hmm. If it's cross-country skiing or running or uh, cycling, you build the engine. And you do that through threshold sessions and lower threshold sessions. So we've done a lot of stuff that I've never done before in the LT1 um, section. So we stay around up from 19 up to two hours is the longest LT1 session I've done, where it's continuously just LT1, which is slightly below 7.3 race pace. Okay. So for me, it's LT1, 7.3 race pace and threshold. Right. And then we also do a lot of threshold sessions. So you have threshold and lower threshold, not so much above it okay. and not so much below it. Right. So you do a lot of stuff that's kind of on some kind of intensity. And can you give me one of your, your LT1 sessions that, that's maybe either your favourite or your hardest or, <laughs> or you think is the kind of like a key session? So a good LT1 session is just 90 minutes continuous on LT1. And if you do um, a test, like um, a step test or something, mm -hmm. you would get your LT1 and you get your threshold. So it's easiest to see like, okay, this is where I need to stay for 90 minutes. A good one also is 45 minutes on LT1, mm -hmm. five minutes on threshold, five minutes recovery, and you do it all once again. And that recovery is completely easy and you, yeah. you just so do yeah, that five right minutes easy. Yeah. And how different for you, like, so, like how many watts power difference in heart rate between your LT1 and your threshold? Like what's the, so, how much harder are you having to work? Uh, it's quite a bit, like my LT1 has also, I managed to push it up quite close. So when we worked a lot on LT1, it was actually really close to the LT2. Uh, so there was not a lot of difference there. Now mm. I've got my LT2 up a little bit more. And normally they follow each other quite a bit too. If we see a lot of good uh, Ironman athletes, their LT1 would almost be like right under the LT2. Okay. And then there's not a lot above it. So you kind of yeah. push everything up there. When you do some short course and do some cycling, you need to have a higher threshold mm. as well. Um, so for me, it's maybe threshold 280 watts and LT1 is now... 235, 240. Okay. And that's like the, um, the true. So a lot of people, like, you get a test and it's like a little bit blown up maybe, but this is like what you can do for really big sessions and you can hold it in training. And what's a, a key threshold session that you've got then? So the, the biggest one we've done in, that was in Sierra Nevada on altitude, was seven by 10 minutes with one minute recovery. Uh, so a lot. A long time to concentrate yeah. and staying. But most of them is around... Uh, 50 minutes to an hour uh, with very short rest. So we keep the rest to maybe one minute uh, and the efforts between eight, 12 minutes in between there. Okay. And you've obviously just been training ahead of Nice in font Rameau and there's quite a lot of hills there. How are you using the hills to help your training? So we normally, if you have a really big threshold session, 
it's a lot closer. Yeah. <laughs> you try to find a hill that's long enough uh, for you to start at the bottom and finish mm-hmm. at the top. Um, I guess just training in Fondre Mer, you get some overgear work because you're gonna hit some really steep parts. I only had a 28 on the back, so I didn't have a lot of like really spinning gears. Yeah. So some of the really long steep climbs actually stuck in you know quite a heavy gear as well. Uh, and you have to like use the dynamics of the hill, trying to be as efficient as possible. So always like find the right gear, read the road ahead of you, and just try to work work with the hills. When you're doing, say, a session, you've got a target and um, what's to hold, but, you know, in the ideal world, we don't normally have a, a set gradient that's the same the whole <laughs> way, and, you know, there's hills that are undulating. How do you guys go about sort of fitting that into your, adapting it to your programme without stressing <laughs> of, oh, my God, like, I'm, I'm having to freewheel here, or how, how do you incorporate that so into So normally, a like, a good thing is to do only right-hand turn uh, loops, <laughs> because it's really right on the right-hand side. Uh, I have a, a pretty good area... That's like a military area, so there's not a lot of cars. And I can do out and back or add like a few loops to just turn around and come back. And it's slightly undulating, so mm-hmm. you hit maybe 60, 65 k's per hour at some parts. And you also have a few turns, and obviously you have a few U-turns to come back. Uh, I normally have my average power up, not okay. the normalized, but the average. Okay. And I just try to make sure that that always around my target watt, which means you need to be able to push... Like, even if I have a long downhill, you have to push the watts in the downhill as well. Otherwise, you find that you're losing your average power really quickly. Yeah. <laughs> as soon as you stop pedaling, you lose it. And, of course, for some corners, you're going to lose it, but you normally get it back because you stand up and accelerate. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you have a really steep hill, or like here in Nice, you have a long, long climb. Obviously, it's different because you're not going to be able to pedal downhill mm. and you're going to have... You might have to, like, do a new lap just to know that you're hitting about where you should be. But it's a really good practice to trying to stay on the average watts that you want to be. And also if you look at a race, if you look at the 70.3 race, <clears throat> what was your average watts and what was your normalized? Mm. And the average watts is what you actually put down. And that's what matters. Yeah. Uh, so it's a good figure to kind of keep in mind. And when you're training, what numbers do you have on your bike computer? What do you Ooh. go by? Uh, so more and more when I do time trial, I have the speed as well. So mm-hmm. trying to look at the speed and just keep the speed up at all the time. I have my average power my three second average power, okay. lap time, heart rate and cadence. Wow, you've got a lot of things. <laughs> yeah, wow, that's big, yeah. huge. Yeah. And do you have the same for racing as yeah. you do for training? Yeah, okay. yeah. it's cool. like to keep the same. Yeah. What I don't have, like what I need to actually look at when I'm racing is the overall time, because yeah. I don't have that on my normal, so then I have to like flip back. Yeah. But I might add that one for Nice actually. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I have it too. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. That's like a, a real insight into and yeah, really open. Um, we just wish you loads of luck for, for the race in Nice thank you. And on this awesome course. Thank cool. you. Thanks, Lisa. <laughs> Well, a massive thank you to Lisa. She might not have had that magic recipe that we were hoping for, but she's certainly given some very useful training insights. And I think there's no excuses now. It's just time to go out and do some work on the bike if we want to get any faster. Well, if you've enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed speaking to Lisa, give us a thumbs up, like, and hit the globe to subscribe. And if you want some session ideas, well, Fraser and I made a video on three bike sessions to get stronger, and you can find that just down here. And if you want to lose weight through cycling, you can find a video on that just down here.